One of the things that made me like Margo right off the bat is uh, we're both from Texas. <laughs> and you're from where? where uh, I'm from Jacksonville. Jacksonville. And can you situate that for us? It's bit? halfway between Tyler and Shreve in Dallas and our, uh, our Dallas and Shreveport. Now, did your, did your family have a tradition of, of uh, arts, uh, work in the arts, acting or anything? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> my, my brother, m one brother's an all-American all football player, the other's a professional golfer, and my father was a lumber man. Do you remember, uh, was there a particular uh, experience or time in your life that made you think that you wanted to be uh, an actor? I, I was acting always in, in my backyard, but I didn't know that's what it was. Mm. And uh, at about 16, uh, the choir director, I was a cheerleader in, in Texas, of course, and, uh, and the choir director came to me and said, um, you have a loud voice, will you come audition for our, our <laughs> musical? I said, yeah, okay, <laughs> and yeah. I was done. Now, did you have any sort of a, a any kind of training at all when you were doing that when you were younger? Did you take classes and no. stuff or no? The classes and acting in Jacksonville. In Jacksonville, no. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. no. Uh -uh. So, so you were just out there, you just memorized the part, you got on the stage and you did it. And loved it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What, was your first, uh, what was your first television uh, or film role? I think my of, of note. Oh, uh, no, like, like well, where you like had lines, like you had oh, lines, lines and stuff. Well, that's yeah. why I'm going to tell you, Wednesday, I didn't have any with no lines. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. I yeah. did too. Plenty. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think it was, um, I think it was a, a, a television movie with Alfre Woodard called something. Yeah. And I don't remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I shot it in Canada. That's all I remember. And I was, a, I was a, addicted to drugs. On the show. On the show. Okay, that's good. That's good. It's important to clarify that. <laughs> did, did you? Um, what? What was? What was television like when you were starting out? Like, what was your impression of it, and how did people perceive it? I think that television was. I always thought that all of it was the same. Mm -hmm. And I did. I'd say I had done about from from uh, sixteen till you know when I. Uh, Nine, till to 2000, I must have done 200 plays. Mm -hmm. So I thought plays were, I, I only thought that's what I wanted to do was act. I didn't know really I was, wanted to act in anything but plays. And so television came and um, uh, I mean, I remember I took a class, okay, I took a class in television commercials, acting for television commercials. Mm -hmm. And I remember I got my first commercial at the end of the class. It was a Gillette Right Guard commercial. And I called my mother and I told her, Mom, I'm going to be a star. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing in the Gillette uh, commercial? I, I was walking through a bank with a shower over my head, uh, something like that, and, and, it, and it never aired. <laughs> yeah. You got paid, I hope. I got paid for that day, that's for sure. That's the important part. So. Uh, I wonder about um, your, I, I, I almost hesitate to use the word process because I think you, could, you would just laugh at me, but, but different actors have different approaches to how they get into character. And some of them, like you're playing a cab driver, it's like, great, I'm going to be a cab driver for six months and interview cab drivers. And other people are like, give me the pages and they go on the set and do it. And then there's a whole range of things in between. How, how do you approach things? A whole diff uh, many different ways. Yeah. Um, if it's somebody real, mm -hmm. I do a lot of research, and then I load myself with ammunition, and, and, and I learn everything. I, I think the most important thing to me is to know it so well that you know it backwards and forwards, mm -hmm. so that you don't have to think about it again. And you're loaded with the world of whatever it is, and then you let it happen. Mm and I respond to whatever you say and, you, and I listen. Because if you plan it out, and there are people that plan it out, where's the life in that? Mm -hmm. It can't be alive if, if whoever you're speaking to doesn't affect how you say whatever you're gonna say. Right. When you say plan it out, what do you mean? I, mean, I just have heard people say, you know, I, 
I know what I'm going to do at this moment and I know where I'm going to go here and that's the way I want to put my hand and hmm so you so you like you're a little more intuitive then in the way you're well I'm 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 prepared mm -hmm. I'm extremely prepared and then I sort of let it hang out right <laughs> yeah all right so I want to talk before we move on to CTP I want to talk about some of your other iconic roles uh, because I know the audience will want to hear about these. Uh, the first one I want to talk to you about is uh, The Americans. Playing Claudia on The Americans, the KGB handler of Philip and Elizabeth Jennings, among other agents. Um, tell me about your first, uh, your, your first uh, experience acting on that show and, and what did it feel like? What, is the, what does it feel like to be that character and to be in this very, very tense, anxious kind of drama? It feels like being in a very tight box mm. and uh, with my hands tied behind my back. <laughs> yeah. And it's stressful. Mm. How so? Um, I guess because it's all internal. And it's, it's, every, it's e uh, against every instinct I have. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, that's not true. It, it, that is me. So, uh, I mean, it, it's everything Claudia is, I, me, I'm not. So, uh, so even speech-wise, I tried to do the speech as if I had learned English uh, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Which I did. I learned it in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> well, it used to be its own country, you know. Absolutely. And they never let you forget if you grew up there. So that really helped. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I, and to have sort of a, a spin of a of a different world. Mm -hmm. uh, but it makes it hard, and the language is hard. The language is hard. What do you mean? The way well, it's the written? word the words are hard. Hmm. In what way? Well, there's a lot of Russian. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you meant the English dialogue too. That's what I mean. <laughs> I'm not speaking Russian. Right. It's right. all the English dialogue, but it has a lot of Russian influences. The and phrasing, it, you mean? The phrasing and the rhythms that they use are very different from hanging. Mm -hmm. It's very unrelaxed uh, dialogue. It's not relaxed dialogue. There's not space to muse much. It's it's a it's a, it's it's tight. You know, I hadn't thought of it until you when you bring it up that way. But the characters who are Russians posing as Americans do, they do have a different way of speaking than the Native Americans do, the na native-born Americans. It's more it is more uh, formal. It's form. It's more, more formal. Of exact, and like and when Philip and Elizabeth talk to each other, it sounds like they're uh, like they're a couple of doctors discussing how they're going to remove your. That's liver. right. But you remember, they're a younger generation than Frank and me. Right. Frank Langella. Frank Langella. Uh, he plays Gabriel, or did. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He's still there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but not in the U.S. anymore, though. <laughs> not, not yet. Oh, right. um, and uh, we're of a different generation, so ours should be a little more formal, mm -hmm. a little more stilted. Mm -hmm. And I, this is all my own idea. Right. I mean, nobody. I mean, I'm just saying that. That's the what I've come up with, and uh, I came up with the idea that I learned English in Moscow, and then we tried out my English in Canada uh, as a shopkeeper or something, and I passed the mustard, and then I was shipped to outside of Washington D.C. Hmm. What was your favorite? Do you have a favorite scene from shoot, from the Americans? My favorite scene is when I slit the guy's throat and watched him bleed out. Applause! <laughs> watched him bleed out and told him why I hated his guts. <laughs> tell me about shooting. Tell me about shooting that scene. It was really fun. <laughs> it was really fun. Yeah. Well, number one, I had to taser him. First, right. uh, posing as a grandmother or an aunt or somebody. Yes. Can I use your telephone? <laughs> you know, or something like that. I go. I don't. I, and then I had to 
you know, and then I pick up the phone and then I, boom, <clears throat> and, um, and he goes down. Okay, using that taser mm -hmm. was real. It, I mean, it was real in that it wasn't electric, but it had a thing that came out of it. Everybody on the set had on huge plastic goggles so that they wouldn't get hit in the eyes or anything. What did I have on? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. And when the thing bounced, it would bounce back this way. Oh, my God. So I put my own life in my <laughs> own hands for that part. <laughs> you gave it all for your art. I That's gave great. it all. Uh, and then I, and then you know, I got to just sit there and tell him, tell him why he was a snake. Yeah, you really stuck it to him in yeah, that scene. Yeah, I did. It was really so satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, uh, you, I wanted to go back to something you were saying when you said that Claudia is internal. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? Like the characters, like in the sense that she's hiding things, or she's not as expressive as as other characters on the show, or how do you mean? Everything that's going on is going on very loudly inside her head, mm -hmm. but she's not able to 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 say it the way she wants to. I, in some way, mm -hmm. there's a moment on the most recent season where Philip and Elizabeth, uh, the married couple posing as uh, their spies, posing as Americans, travel agents. They ha they're starting to pull back. They're starting to pull back from the KGB. And they say, uh, they come over, they have a conversation with you, uh, details of a mission, and you say to them, you're act you've been acting as kind of a mother confessor with them in the earlier seasons, but they don't want to do that anymore. They want to pull away, not get close. And you sort of invite them again to be, to, to disclose things, personal things, to like, I'm here if you want to talk to me, and they don't. And you give them this look it's, I don't even know how to describe this look, but it's like, it's a, it's a, uh, I think, I'm not an actor, okay? I, all I do is watch people do this stuff, but I always think that one of the most difficult things to do is to tell the audience that you have a hidden agenda or that you're seeing through somebody, but do it in a way so that the characters in the scene would not catch on. So you're telling, you know, you're, you're letting the audience in on it, but it's not unbelievable. You wouldn't look at the scene and go like, oh, they would totally know she's lying or she's hiding her true opinion. Do you have a way that you do that? Well, I, c I think that w what you're talking about, they had turned from me. Yes. So that whatever I do is what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. But I also am savvy enough, savvy enough to know that the audience is seeing that too. Right. So that it's my way to give an idea of where I, what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? I just think it. And I used to think that it was easier for people to read your minds in, I guess in life, but mostly in, uh, in uh, television and movies. Mostly in movies is what I thought if you had blue eyes. Hmm. I've decided that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it almost sounds like, it sounds like almost like you're saying like if you think it, the camera's gonna pick it up. Well, I think that's true. Hmm. And, and really, honestly, that's almost all you need to do sometimes. Hmm. Uh, uh, I think I kind of learned that uh, name dropping from Paul Newman. Hmm. He was very sweet to me and, you know, told me a few things. Well, what are some of the other things he told you? Well, both, mostly that. And yeah. also he did tell me to, oh, hello. <laughs> How are you? This is John Solberg. John Solberg. From FX, or by FX the way. FX Network. Attending as a fan. We're talking about the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> That to, when you turn your he turn your head, do it very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so big. Right, right. I decided that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So so. Anyway. Uh, 
Mo moving on, this is another one, miles apart from Claudia, is Mags Bennett on Justified. Uh huh. Mags Bennett, I, I, she lives on in my mind. I, I, they gave her such a great send off, but um, I loved that character and I loved how, uh, 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 she, how big she was, how like her personality was just ridiculously, you know, she was like Ma Barker almost. Um, how did you end up uh, 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 playing that role? How did you sort of approach that part? Did you have any particular models in mind? Did you have any, any sort of roadmap for that? Well, how I got the part was that I was out in Los Angeles for a premiere of Secretariat, and I stayed on a little while longer to do Harry's Law or whatever that thing Kathy Bates was doing. She wanted me to play this part. And, um, and in the meantime, my agent said that there's a part on this show um, called Justified that they'd like to see you for. I said, oh, I, what, what is it? I never, I don't know anything about it. And it had been on a season. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, it's to play a, uh, this woman who's a, a drug lord on a mountain in Kentucky. I said, well, just tell them, it, send them my tape. I don't want to have to read for that. <laughs> 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 they said no go, yeah. and they said they they want to hear me say the lines. Do you remember what scene you had to re uh, do at the audition? No. No. Yeah. No, I don't remember. But I know that when I read the script, I said I will go anywhere, any in any state, to read for this part, mm. because I knew that that part uh, was like going to be a a field day for me. Mm. because I'd never played anything like that, but I had been playing that in my backyard for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> she's, now, she's a complicated character because she is, she's menacing, she's tough, she's the head of a crime family, she keeps her sons in line, she, she sort of rules this entire part of the state, uh, but there's also a strange idealistic streak to her, like she's concerned about the people of the region. Or, yeah. Yeah, well, or at least her own share of it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and very religious in her own uh, mountain way. Mm. And, you know, but things were by Mag's Law. <laughs> Mag's Law, yeah. yeah. Mag's Law. Mm. And uh, I just love Mag's Bennett. Tell me, tell me about what it was like to play scenes opposite Timothy Oliphant. Great. Yeah. Sure, great. Everything was great about that. Yeah. Every single thing was great about it. Uh, it was, uh, it was to me, it was like flying. I've never had more fun. Hmm. Because I was free. I was wearing men's pants and a man, man's belt, and you know my hair is just like, Ugh, and <laughs> nothing on my face, and I could talk in my own voice. You know, I didn't have to try to doll it up a little bit or anything. Yeah. And I found so much out in doing that is the more true to your own voice you are, it's just better. Hmm. You don't have to try to fit into anybody's box. That you are unique. That's really what I found out. And it sort of has lifted me and put me somewhere else. Hmm. So I thank John Landgraf and uh, FX Network. <laughs> <laughs> So now you, so you, I would say that with that role and, and probably the Americans as well, you became esteemed character actress Margot Martindale. <laughs> yeah, I guess I did. And you, and, and then you were enshrined as that character on BoJack Horseman. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of BoJack fans in the house. That's and great. you know what? I think, I think esteemed character actress Margot Martindale might be a, had drowned in the ocean. They haven't called me to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was a cartoon. I could come back to life. <laughs> So how did that come about? Did they just call you up and say, hey, esteemed character? No, no, Martin Will Hill Arnett, I was doing the Millers with Will Arnett, and Will Arnett said, hey, I got this cartoon I'm doing. Uh, I'd like you to come do it. I said, I, I can't, I'm not going to, I'm doing this, I can't do it. I, that show was mind-boggling for me. And I said, too hard, can't, can't do anything else, not going to do it. He said, oh, yeah, you're going to do it. I said, no, I'm not doing it, Will. He said, the part is <laughs> Margo Martindale character actress. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> then I read it, and I said, I just got to tell you something. I said, these people seem like animals to me. <laughs> he said, they are animals. <laughs> Anyway, it's been fun. It when was you fun. when you say when you say they're animals, that's not usually what you mean. <laughs> exactly, like no, but they are animals. Yeah, <laughs> that's marvelous. Okay, so now uh, let's. I want to uh, talk to you about Sneaky Pete, and I've I've chosen a few clips here, and I want to I want to show them. I guess first, maybe if you can set up for us the context of this, your character, and and the situation that we that uh, the audience finds itself in. And then I just want to show three different clips and we'll talk about what's going on in that scene and, and when, what you're doing. Okay. Uh, you want to know the premise of the show? Yeah. Just okay, the premise of the show is, and you must watch it, it's on Amazon Prime, uh, it's, um, is, is that we have a, a, a farm in Connecticut, blue collar Connecticut, but the farm isn't blue collar, it's gorgeous. And uh, we are bail bondsmen, my husband and me, and uh, our grandchildren live with us. They're grown, of course. I'm way too young to have grandchildren that, that old. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> and and um, esteemed character. <laughs> <Mark> yes. <Martin. laughs> and and my grandson, one of my grandsons, and his mother, his my daughter. Uh, we we haven't spoken in years. And my grandson, who who came to stay with us for years, until he was about 11, we haven't seen for 20 years. And uh, come to find out, uh, he comes back to see us, shows up on our porch. We don't know where he's been for 20 years and says, Grandma, Grandpa, I'm home. And um, his, he's Pete, but really, he's not Pete. He was uh, in prison with my grandson, Pete, and he stole his identity and uh, when he got out, he came to our, our farm that he had heard a lot about from our grandson. Now, we believe he's Pete, or maybe. And, and what's, fa what's fascinating about this is that um, your character and uh, your, uh, your, your husband on the show are both, I, there are moments when I feel like I don't know, I feel like I know that they know and they've decided not to, just not to think about the fact that they know that, you know, like they, there's suspicion there, but there's also wanting him to be I think the it's both. I think it's all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know anything more than that mm -hmm. by the end of the season. I mean, I think, I mean, I have something in my head that I think, but I don't know if it's going to mesh up with what Graham Yost thinks. Right, exactly. Okay, so we're going to show this first clip. This is a fairly, uh, fairly light one here. It's a close-up of you. You're, you're listening more than you're talking, but there's about three or four different things happening. One of them is there's business. There's this, the details of this business. This is a guy giving you a report about you know, something that you asked for. And then there's this whole issue of is this or is this not my grandson? And then there's also a grandmotherly concern for what's going on in his life. Like, oh boy, what's the boy up to? Uh, and then there's the, the bit about the, the cheating setting off your alarms. That's a lot, to, that's a very short scene and that's a lot of emotional information. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, and something that they didn't keep uh, in that, cl in, in, on my side, that I think they should have, uh, is that when he is going on and on and on, I'm doing this. Come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> because he's so slow. Um, and we have a, and there's the relationship I have with him. Right. Uh, Sam, I, I, we, we did have something. We might have had an affair, uh, but on paper and we, we say we have not had an affair, mm -hmm. but my husband suspects we've had an affair. That's one thing that's going on. He owes us money or he owes me something, so he's got to do this, you know, this de de detective work. Um, and what, trying to figure out what, what Pete's doing and where he's going and who is he. Mm -hmm. What else is there? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, 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 
a close-up of a person thinking is my favorite kind of thing in a movie. Mine too. Yeah. And, and the thing that you were talking about earlier, that idea that we can pick up on what you're feeling and what you're thinking just by watching you think, that the camera can pick it up, is yeah. interesting. And it also goes back to that, I, that thing we were talking about at the beginning about preparation, that you have, you've, you've, you've absorbed the material, you've memorized the lines, you've ingested all of these ideas about the characters, and now something is happening that's sort of almost a chemical thing that you can't... Well, that's what it should be. Yeah. I think. I remember when I, a long time ago, sitting under a tree, reading a script. This is, I was doing a play at Harvard, not, you know, musical. And I was, it was just during the daytime, I was sitting in, under a tree. I was very young. And the sun hit me in such a way. And, and I looked at it and I thought, I think I want to be in movies because I thought that's the kind of moment I want to see in a movie. Hmm. It's and that's really what you're think, talking about. Right. It's about just being and just reading what it is that's going on in your head. Right. Right. I think that's the most interesting thing anybody can do. A good friend of mine said that, uh, he's a big film lover, he said that the reason he loves movies so much is it gives him a chance to stare at people's faces while they're thinking and they, and they don't get creeped out because they don't know that he's there. That's not like that. <laughs> so now I want to uh, uh, show you another one. This is a little more, a little more comedic, uh, quite a bit more comedic. Uh, let, we can roll the second clip here. Uh, it, it, are you a person who cracks up when you're shooting a scene? Mm -hmm. you, you do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How, how long did it take to get everything you needed for that scene? Because I can, there, there, you, I can tell you, both you, you and Peter Garrity, it seems like you're having a lot of fun. I love him so much. Yeah, tell me about him. Well, he's just an extraordinary actor, I think. He's a man that still has everything going on, and he's in his 70s, and he's scary and funny and fabulous. Mm -hmm. A good kisser, and I love slapping him. <laughs> you got to be yourself with this large mechanical object staring at you and these lights and everything. When that obviously it's second nature to you now. I, I don't I really don't even think about it. You don't even think about mm -hmm. it. Was there a time when you did think about it? I don't it? think so. No, not from the beginning. I think that I, I think that I I did a I remember a movie I did The Rocketeer mm -hmm. and um, that's a good movie. It was a good movie. Yeah. And yeah, I can't remember the guy's name that directed it. Joe Johnston. Joe Johnston. Yeah, Texan, I think. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> he, he told me that when I, I remember when I went to do looping, it was called then, uh, he said, the funny thing about you, Margo, is any time I needed to cut to anything, you were always acting. Hmm. So I never knew. I didn't know you weren't supposed to act when the camera wasn't on you or, or anything. So, uh, you know, it was a... Uh, I don't even know why I got off on that. Something about, about I, I don't know. I guess I, I, it didn't matter if, if the ca I didn't know when the camera was on or off or, or on me or not on me. Yeah. It, it's so wonderful just to be in a room and to forget about that. And who can do that best of all is Clint Eastwood in that crowd. Hmm. Because Clint Eastwood is, well, I think there's a lot more respect for him now than there was, you know, God, he's been in movies forever. But at the beginning, they, they, people didn't think much of him as an actor. But I gather you do. I thought a lot of him as a director. Mm. And as an actor, too, yeah. But, you know, he would just, he would just say, just start whenever you want to. Mm -hmm. So you didn't know when the camera was going or not going. Because I was going to say, he doesn't say action. Uh -uh. No. What is it? He says something like, let's do this or I, something? I don't, no, he just, I don't, I don't remember him saying anything. It's all quiet. I don't know where camera, where the cam, were there cameras there? And I guess so, because I saw it. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it, was, it was a fascinating, quietest set I've ever been on. Hmm. Are mo most sets are louder than that. Most sets, a lot of sets are really loud. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. A lot of, yeah. But no, you you got to forget about that. You got to forget. In fact, you know, it's all very, very uh, egotistical. Mm. You know, you got to, you know, I, 
I mean, it's a terrible thing to say, but you know, you got to think that what you're doing is interesting. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's really it. When uh, I I like to talk to actors about the difference between stage acting and film acting, and I like to do it for a moment here too. So you st like a lot of actors, you started out on the stage, you moved into movies and television. Do you feel that there are differences, basic differences between acting for the stage and acting for the screen? Not basically. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there are many. Well, the fact that you had to do it every day, the same performance. So I do that like I, cor I, I, I do the, the rehearsal just like I would do anything and find it and find, but you find it a little slower in a play or I find it a little slower in a play. And then once I find it, then I choreograph it mm -hmm. so that the dance steps are sort of the same, but the other part is hanging so that you can it's very technical, but it's not technical, mm -hmm. so that you have the freedom to, to live. Uh, so there is that that's the same, because it's found in the same way, but it has to be repeated, so it has to be, it has to be really technical. Mm -hmm. uh, and film and television, it's the same. Do you feel that when you're acting for the camera that the acting is smaller or more oh, delicate think, in some way? Yeah, I mean, you can be so intimate. Yeah. So intimate. If you've got to do a scene where they're shooting it from a variety of distances, like they get a wide shot where you, your character's tiny in the frame, and then they do a close-up where you, from here to here, do you do the lines differently when they're shooting a long shot, or do you do it all the same? Differently. Yeah? I would think. I mean, I think a long shot, I would do it the same, but when you get up real close, you do it differently. I mean, you do it, yeah, you do it smaller. Mm -hmm. You can do it smaller. Mm -hmm. Come here, you know, could do it, you know. It's a, but it's all adjusting. It, it's all the same, though. It's just... It's organically you find out where it should be, I think. Was there a moment during the shooting of Sneaky Pete when you said, okay, I got this. Yeah, and, and I, I, I know I, what this is. I think this was episode eight. Yeah. And <laughs> I know, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in the woods with uh, Peter and, uh, and Shane. Uh, the guy who plays my grandson, and I said, oh, I get it, y'all. I get what this is. What was it? I said, I think this is kind of Fargo-like. <laughs> <laughs> that it was a little bit funny. Yeah. I mean, I thought, I, I, I found that it was, it, it had a, um, it, it, there was a comedy part of it that I didn't really know. Right, right. And doing this show very differently from other shows that I've been on, it's the first one I've done that is uh, comes out at once. So that this entire season, 10 episodes, we never saw anything except the pilot. So I didn't know what I was doing. And I just hoped and prayed that I was arcing it right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, holding back enough. There was one place where I thought, oh dear, I've, I've let that go too far too soon. Uh, it, it seemed okay when I saw it, but I, I, I worried about that, mm -hmm. that I had, uh, that I'd cracked a little early. Do you watch the shows that you appear in? Mm -hmm. So you keep, you keep track, even if it's, even the scenes you're not in? The there are some in? shows that I've been, done that I haven't seen. Uh-huh. Why do you watch that? Because I know some actors don't. Well, I think you have to see what you're doing to see if you're, if you're who you think you are. Hmm. Does uh, it? Does it? No, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. What? Oh, does it also? You were talking about the arc, car tracking your character's arc. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Uh, well, I, I, and when this show, and most television, you don't know how it's going to end. I mean, I didn't know I was going to die at the end of Justified, uh, but how would you know you were going to die anyway? So, <laughs> right. <laughs> So it's very, it's very much alive. I think television's more alive than anything else because there is no end. Mm. 
uh, you don't know the end. You know the end in plays, you know the end in movies, but you don't know the end in television. So you can only kind of live in the character's moment like you do in your life. Hmm. Um, what else? Where was I going with that before? I don't know, but it's more interesting than where I was taking it. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's fascinating to, to see. And, and, and for example, for the Americans, because I was on it the whole first season, then I was not on it because of, I went off and did another show. For, I mean, I was on it, but I wasn't on it like I was. And I, and I don't know. I hope that I kept hold of her through those three seasons. I think I did since they let me come back. You won an Emmy. Oh, I did. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. For those seasons that I shouldn't have, let me just say. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's interesting to try to, it, because you're watching what you're doing. You're, you're in charge of your own thing. Uh, is it a matter of just, is it a housekeeping sort of thing where you want to, where you want to keep track of where you were the last time you played that part so it doesn't seem like you're pl suddenly playing it differently or? Well, that, that, but also in something like Sneaky Pete, I wanted to know emotionally where I was and how to, uh, how, how far to go. I made a mistake in, I think, episode, starting in episode eight, I believe it was, to what I wore, because I wore it for three episodes. Hmm. And I thought I was gonna wear a jacket all the way through. <laughs> well, whatever, it's so stupid. <laughs> but I didn't look very good in that sweater. <laughs> 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 but in my head, I had the jacket on <laughs> the whole time, but I didn't, because I knew, I knew that it wasn't right for me to have the jacket on. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I suffered and looked at my pathetic shoulders for the rest <laughs> of the time. This, this idea that acting on a TV show is like life because you don't know what's coming next and you don't know when the end is coming for you, is it, that's, that's, that's a fascinating concept. It's the truth. And so when, you, when did you find out that they were going to kill your character on Justified? Who, and who delivered the bad news? What an asshole. <laughs> 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 Graham Yost writes, wrote Justified and his whole team of writers, and they write Sneaky Pete. So we've made up. Uh, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Graham forgot to tell me I was going to die. Oh, no. And I got the script. He's supposed to, he called everybody else, he just didn't call me. <laughs> oh, my God. So. So Timothy Oliphant said to me, how are you today? I said, well, I, I, I'm dead. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah. So you said that she found it out when you're sitting there reading the script? Uh-huh. Oh. Uh. And I think Tim called Graham and said, you know, you really ought to come out here and tell Marlon you're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so for, I think, I don't know how long, for, for years, Graham, uh, for a year, I know for a year, he, on his screensaver, he had me sitting there shooting in the finger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do, you feel, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you feel that you should have continued or you no. wish you had continued? No. I wanted to continue, but I knew I shouldn't. Mm. Why, why did you know It was you too great and too big and wonderful. I mean, bam, bam, bam. It's the way it should have been. Mm. She didn't, Max Bennett shouldn't limp into another season. Hmm. And yet, they, as they proceeded, the members of the Bennett clan kept being a problem for the hero of the show. Well, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. The echo, the, 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 the echoes continue. That's good. Like, I'm glad. They're all the way up to the end. I'm it's so like, happy. They kept discovering new Bennetts. It's like, there's a whole bunch of other Bennetts in Florida. I'm like, okay, we'll go deal with them now. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. <laughs> I think it's a, te it's a, it's a te well, it's a testament to, to, to how memorable you were. That it's like, it was it's like, like in Charlotte's Web. Charlotte dies, and there's a bunch of little baby spiders hatching. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Very happy about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the third one I want to show is uh, we'll go ahead and show this. This is this is probably probably my favorite moment of your of your of your performance. That's a great scene. It is a great. That's scene. That's an added scene. Oh, really? 
Yeah, we shot that when Amazon picked up the show. Why did they add it? I think they wanted to make it grittier and more interesting. Mm -hmm. This show, the pilot was done for CBS. And uh, it was written by David Shore and Brian Cranston. David Shore, really, and Brian Cranston's idea. David, I think, decided he wasn't right to write a, binge a bingeable show, and I think he pulled out. He's a network writer and a fantastic writer, and I think he's incredible. And so they hired, they hi when Amazon picked it up, they added this scene, and, and then they hired these writers, Graham Yost and his crowd, uh, about we shot that in July, and we, they hired them in the end of January. Mm. So, yeah, so it was a whole new show. And that helped bridge us into the whole new feeling. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about what's happening in this scene on a, I guess, an, inter on an internal level, an emotional level. What I love about this scene, and it, it's something it has in common with, I think, a, a lot of your scenes on, on The Americans, is what I call plausible deniability. This, the focus is on G, uh, Giovanni Ribisi's uh, 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 reaction to what you're doing. But you have your back to him through most of the scene. You walk in, then you got your back to him, you turn around, and there's only one moment of eye contact in this scene. You only look at him once, and it's very, very brief. And but the way you look at him, it's not like a, I'm on to you, you bastard. It seems more like a grandmother, do you understand the information that I've given you about the fox and the eggs? You know, like I feel like it's, it's discombobulating for him because maybe he, do, he, he it's like, does she, does she know? Does she know? And I wonder about the eye, the, the eye contact. Whose decision was that to only have you look that one time? Me. Okay, why? It was too hard to do it more than once. Because if I did it more than once, I would lean too hard. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I could not lean any way and keep this alive. Mm -hmm. So if I looked at him uh, and say, can we do that? That's too long. Mm. Because then you know that I know. I felt horribly guilty when you did that just now. Right. I have no reason to. Yeah. And that's why you can't, but uh, we can't let that happen, can we? Mm -hmm. Can we, Matt? No. No, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we're out of time. No. So, so it, it, you know, I knew, I mean, I, Brian was there. I don't even remember who directed it. Oh, I, I think Seth Gordon directed that too. Uh, that scene. I can't remember if Seth was there or not, yeah. but I think so. And uh, Brian, they, they, Brian and, and James Dagos, he's the one who's another, he's like Brian's uh, producing partner. Uh, he, they, they, they wanted me, s they, what I, information I did know is that you shouldn't know what I'm thinking. Yes, yes. And that was very hard. Hmm. Did you talk to Giovanni about all of this? No. No? No, Giovanni was great. He's great. He did, you don't need to talk to him. It's, you, he's just really wonderfully fun to act with. Yeah. No, I mean, I love talking to him, but I mean, yeah. I don't need to discuss things. Or so, you didn't, so you didn't discuss like what you were gonna do and what he was uh -uh. gonna do or any of that stuff? Uh -uh. Uh -uh. So he, so the look of not knowing what the hell to think is, he's, he's kind of not acting there. Uh, he, he, he's, he, he, that's him. He doesn't have the information. He, he's loaded. I mean, he knows, he, he acts in the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I, if, I, if, I, if I leaned too much, if I, like I was doing here, if I, if I said, we can't let that happen. I, I, think I, I think at one take I said, we can't let that happen, can we, Dan? And then I looked up and said, can we, Pete? And that was too much. Too much, right, right. Yeah. Well, uh, 
Would you be all right with uh, opening the floor up for some questions? Sure, I'd love okay. to. All right. And what would that spark come about? Well, you know what the good wife was? A luxury job. <laughs> really good clothes, <laughs> really great hours, <laughs> really great writing, I thought, and really, really, really fun. Uh, it was a fun job as I was waiting for Sneaky Pete to start. <laughs> mm. That's really what it was. It was a great job. It's, it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm this, and then I'm that. <laughs> and then I'm not that. Very, very easy. Year, years ago, I talked to James Gandolfini. It was around season four. I think at the end of season four of The Sopranos, they were re all the renegotiating their contracts. <laughs> and I said, so is, or is the show going to continue? And he said, I don't know. He said, I don't know if I want to go back to this show. And I said, well, this is the show that made you an international star. Why would you not want to go back to this show? And he said, because he said, honestly, I come home at night from playing this guy. He's a bad guy. And he said, no matter how long I spend in the shower, I can't wash the stink of so Tony Soprano off. Wow. Of yeah. So it, it affected him very, very I think I think I think a lot of actors have that. Yeah. But I, you I don't have any of it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Anybody else? Yes, in the back there. Uh, yes, I can tell you one uh, thing in exactly. Some director, I'd love to say his name and what it was, <laughs> but I won't, um, said to me, and this was a big movie, it was a big moment, and he said to me, do you know that you, you, you added 60 seconds to that? I said, are we doing a commercial? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't helpful. Mm. Uh, he, was under, he was under stress. Mm. He was stressed out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so much fun. Now, I haven't had to audition. This is hilarious. I haven't had to audition in like four years which is a real nice uh, plus. Recently, in the last two months, some directors, <laughs> writers, wanted me to come and audition for a movie. Now, I've auditioned for them before, and they've never hired me, them being a, a pair of brothers. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> Gee, <laughs> I wonder which brothers. And I like their movies. <laughs> yeah. And um, the, and it was the lead in one of these little movie. Uh, it's a, a movie. It's a Cohen Brothers, and they were doing a uh, uh, six short movies in one. And and they had asked me to audition for first. They had asked me to audition for a uh, um, landlady in Missouri. And it had five lines. And I said, I, I don't want to play a landlady in Missouri. And I certainly don't want to play five lines. <laughs> I don't want to go in for five lines. I'm sorry, I just don't. And that might be snobby of me and obnoxious of me, but I didn't want to. Let that go. And then they come back around and they say they want me to audition for the lead of one of these things. And I read it and I went, it's interesting. It's very interesting. Uh, but the fact that they want me to audition for it <laughs> mm -hmm. is, means that they don't really think I'm right for it. Hmm. I said to my agent, he said, you've got to just go and do it. I said, I don't want to, but I will. Mm. And that was it. If they told you that it was a part I of- I certainly didn't get the job, as I told <laughs> him I wouldn't. If they told you it was a part of a landlady and you had five lines, but at the end of it you get to kill a guy and watch him bleed out? <laughs> yes, I'd do that! Yeah. <laughs> I'd yeah, do that. Right. But uh, it was, uh, I, I had an agenda in my head about them before I went in, which is not right. I, you, uh, I, in the old days, old days meaning four years ago, uh, <laughs> I, I like to not know anything about the people so that I didn't have anything in my head except you're going to love me. And be prepared. That's the most important thing, is just to know it backwards and forwards. 
And when I went in for the Coen Brothers, I didn't really know it very well. It wouldn't have changed anything. I heard what who they cast. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, way in the back there. Well, I did tons of plays, but here's what I did when it came to television and film and all that is take the job, take the job, take the job, take the job, take the job. Didn't matter what it was. Didn't matter if it's the same part. Didn't matter what it was. Plus, also, I needed the money de desperately. Uh, so take the job and, and, and keep moving forward. Uh, and someday somebody will give you a part like Mags Bennett, and then the whole world opened. Even though I'd had a great career before that, the whole world opened from from a part that that I just let my own self be be use my whole imagination. Hmm. I think I'm very fortunate, and I think that there are more female characters, powerful f women female characters, than there were. Um, especially older. It's hard to be a young character person. I don't have to act old anymore. Hmm. <laughs> Great. I think one more. I remember that I I was the head of an orphanage, and I, if the children didn't do what I wanted, I'd put them in the dog bin. <laughs> <laughs> there were little hints of Mags Bennett coming about. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But I think that that's harder than anything. Is it? Yeah, they act, want so much from you, and they ask you to be so much bigger and bigger and bigger. Be more Margot, be more Margot, be more Margot. <laughs> that's that's, that's some shit. I mean, I, how can I be any more than I am? <laughs> they really want a lot. I think it takes more energy, it mm -hmm. seems to me. Mm -hmm. I just did a car in Cars 3, and it was a, also a lot of, it takes a lot of energy. I, I talked to Rami Malek yesterday from Mr. Robot, and that's uh, that's a very voiceover-driven show because so much of it is a subjective look at the world through this one character's eyes. And he told me that he spent a, almost as much time on the voiceover for that show as he did actually appearing yeah. on set. And he also said the same thing you said. He thought that it was more uh, emotionally demanding. It is. More exhausting. It's exhausting. It's interesting because you're just standing in front of a microphone or sitting in front of a microphone. It is exhausting. Mm. And I did this short for Alexander Payne, Clarice Tam, and it was all voiceover. I mean, it was all shot, and then it was all voiceover in French. And it was the hardest day I think I've ever done in my career. Mm. It was eight hours of French voiceover, and, you know, it was hard. Mm. But it's, a, it, it, it's fascinating. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.